So I'm sitting here with Dave Hoover. Dave, you're the man. Um, <laughs> you're a father, a husband, yep. an entrepreneur, yep. um, a thrill seeker. I do like to do some <laughs> thrilling things. <laughs> and um, and a found, one of the founders of Dev Bootcamp. Mm -hmm. how, how do you do it all? Well, I'm married, <laughs> and uh, my wife um, definitely like takes care of a lot of stuff for our, our family. And my kids are pretty old okay. uh, for my age. Uh, my daughter's a junior in high school, okay. and uh, and my my son, my have two sons who are 14 and 11. So that helps in terms of being able to uh, have kids who can sometimes handle themselves without a ton of attention. Mm -hmm. But it's been a long um, process, you know, raising them while trying to, to stay married and, uh, and, and grow some businesses. Of course, I'm yeah. sure. Would you mind briefly telling me about Dev Bootcamp and how it got sure. started? Sure, sure. Uh, Dev Bootcamp got started in 2000, well, late 2011. Okay. A guy named Sharif Bashay, Sharif as a software developer, figured this guy could be a software developer. And so, and his friend wanted to someday work at Apple. And okay. so he's like, let's do it. I'm, we're gonna, I'm gonna teach you what you need to know. He posted to Hacker News, like something about like, hey, I'm gonna teach this guy how to program. Anybody, anybody else interested for like, I think he said like $8,000 or something like that. It's gonna take eight weeks. And it just like, all these people piled on. Some of them were like, you're, this is horrible what you're doing. Like. Um, horrible idea, like you could never learn to program that fast, you're ripping these people off. Other people, tons of other people were like, yes, yes, I want to do it, I want to do it. Um, so that happened in late 2011, and then early 2012, he started, he uh, took some tuition money, bought some tables, bought some Mac minis, put it all together, and taught the first cohort um, out in San Francisco uh, over eight weeks, and then they, uh, they, they graduated and got jobs, and then tech Crunch wrote a little article about it, about how, how many of them got jobs and how much mm -hmm. money they were making, and then that kicked off the whole okay. industry, basically, that, that little TechCrunch article, because people were like, oh my gosh, I could do that. Not only as a student, like, oh, I want to go be a software developer, but other people were like, well, I could start a program. So I was involved uh, very early on. I was helping with Code Academy here in Chicago, which is now called Starter League. Mm -hmm. And they started even earlier than that, in like October of, of 2011. Ultimately decided that I wanted to bring Dev Bootcamp to Chicago because of what it has to offer. And that, that started in April of 2013. I've always seen it as just an amazing, once we got up and running, it's just like this privilege that you get to watch people come in, work really hard, change their lives, and then go get really cool jobs. And we just get to see it, this revolving door, like every three weeks. It's amazing. That's so cool. I actually had a chance to check out the mm -hmm. space yesterday. Um, very cool. Very cool space. We love it. I noticed um, everyone was wearing slippers, though, and this massive mound of shoes. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about your guys' uh, culture. So I, I just mentioned, like, it's a revolving door every three mm -hmm. weeks. Now, the program is nine weeks. Um, mm -hmm. the, the immersive, like, face-to-face -face curriculum is nine weeks. Um, cohorts start every three weeks. So they overlap with each other, okay? So the culture evolves, right? It never ends, right? If we were like a more normal school, we'd like have like 80 students or something. We'd have them there with us for nine weeks. We'd then have some sort of gap, you know, a little break, and then we'd have the next 80 come in. And when you do that, you can kind of reset everything mm -hmm. um, and reset the rules and expectations. But when they overlap with each other, the students learn from the older students, and these interesting customs just start happening. Like we never told them to like not wear shoes. Okay. It's just that some at some point, some like critical mass of the students were. It was probably in actually the winter, when everyone wears boots and then you, they're all snowy, and so you take them off oh, yeah, and you leave them and you leave them by the front door, mm -hmm. and then it just never stopped. They're like, oh, well, I'm just gonna never wear shoes in here anymore. <laughs> Um, and so just all these random little customs just pop up because of the way that we um, overlap the cohorts. That's so <laughs> the way that we sing happy birthday is really weird and um, this like really weird tradition about like basically like, like this little like find the shovel scavenger hunt that we do every three weeks. Um, it's almost impossible to describe <laughs> the strange customs that we have, have uh, discovered. And you're super busy. Mm -hmm. um, how do you find balance in your life? What do you do? Well, I mean, 
Yeah, like so one of the things that, that helps me with my bu busyness is I'm not the director of Chicago's location anymore. Now, there's a guy, a good friend of mine named Leon Gersing, okay. who's the new leader, and he took over this year. And that's created a lot of a lot more flexibility for me, which lets me work at home more honestly, um, which has been great over the summer to be with my kids more. And the clock is really ticking for my daughter. She'll be graduating from high school. You know, she, um, I guess I don't even want to do the math, but anyway, um, less than two years from now. Mm -hmm. So I want to be home more for that. So I'm finding a new balance with like working from home more days a week, and um, and honestly, right now. I get a lot of work done between 5 a.m. and 9 a.m. Right. Uh, I get up really early and just get a bunch of stuff done and so that I can be more flexible with the kids and stuff during the day. So I've, I've read a little bit about you and your wife and you guys kind of do these crazy things together. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Stacy and I met at w when we were camp counselors. Okay. When we were 21. and. Uh, and so like the context of our relationship has always been like taking weird adventures together. Our first like unofficial date was like when she was just like with a bunch of people around the table. She was just like, hey, does anybody want to like um, uh, just ride bikes into town? We were up in rural Wisconsin and like town was like 14 miles away. And I was like, I'll go, sure. And then on that date was like, or on that, sorry, on that little bike ride is when I realized like I wanted this to be more than just friends. Mm -hmm. um, so like we just started doing like long bike rides and like, on mo mountain bikes and stuff um, that summer. And then ever since then, we've just been like doing um, bigger and bigger adventures. Um, the biggest one is probably uh, climbing Mount Rainier out in Seattle, oh, wow. um, which is like 14,000 feet. And it's really, it's on this big glacier. And that was pretty epic. Um, I can't even imagine. It, it's, 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 it was, it's like, it was like going to a different planet, just like being up there, like where there's no trees and mm -hmm. it's just like, you're above the clouds and it's crazy. But yeah, I don't know. Like, it's just something we've always liked. We like to push ourselves. She, she's pushed herself into like Ironman races and like the full Ironman distance races. Right now she's recovering from a knee problem. So she's not able to run, uh, which is hard, yeah. but, um, but yeah, we definitely enjoy uh, pushing ourselves. We both played like high school and college uh, sports. Cool. So it's just something we enjoy. Um, and I know that you, so you, you studied psychology in mm -hmm. school and you were a marriage family counselor for a little while. Yep. How did you make the leap from, from a therapist to a coder? Yeah. Um, <laughs> not a normal transition, although I'm very, I have my ears are so like, uh, uh, sensitive, I guess you could say, to like other similar stories. So I have found some other people out there in the world that have done something similar. Yeah, so I really was focused on kids. Like I finished college and as a psych major and I wanted to get like a master's in family therapy because I believed that like to help kids, which is what I was focused on at the time, you have, it has to kind of happen in the context of their family. Um, so anyway, I went and got my master's in, in family therapy in Seattle, and um, but at the same time, this is like 1998, 1999, like that's when like the dot com boom was mm -hmm. going crazy, and I was in Seattle, which is where I'm from, and I've always been interested in technology and computers, but I just kind of bought the I don't know the misconception of programming that it's like this very very solitary thing, and you're sitting in front of a comp computer for eight hours a day, and it's got to be really boring. Um, and I tried to teach myself to program and it hadn't really worked out because the languages were too hard for me to do what I want, mm -hmm. like which was to make like these cool graphical video games, okay. you know, when I was younger. Yeah. I mean, even when I was like 25, I tried to teach myself some things and I just, I literally read like Java for dummies. Okay. Um, Java is a <laughs> programming language. Actually, yeah. And you felt like a dummy. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You read that I did that. Yeah. I thought you meant you read Java for dummies. No. I don't recommend it. Okay. Uh, it did make me feel dumb. I ended up getting a side job. Um, like I had as a th therapist by day and a like HTML coder by night. And I, one of the things that pushed me to do that was having a daughter when I was 24 while I was in grad school and we were just completely broke and like in, in like mounding, mounds of debt were starting to pile on us. And um, so I just needed to earn a little extra money. And that after about a year of this side job, I realized I really like doing this. I'm like getting energy from it. 
um, this this previous concept of like being really bored by coding, I realized, no, no, no I really actually enjoy it. Um, so it, I made a hard, really hard choice in, in 2000 to like quit my therapy job that I'd worked so hard to get yeah. and, uh, and go and jump into the, the dot-com boom, basically right as it was about yeah. to end, um, which was tricky. Uh, and thankfully it worked out. But I, I was able to get into a really cool like educational tech company in Skokie um, and made the commute from Warrenville which is like 28 miles or 30 miles straight west of Chicago to mm -hmm. Skokie every day, which is like driving by O'Hare on Dempster for like ever. Um, so that was a horrible commute, uh, but it, it was like kind of the paying my dues sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, and they di that company died a year later, but in the process I was able to like become a programmer mm -hmm. and got my next job uh, which I stayed at until the economy kind of turned back around. Wow. I worked at the American Medical Association as a programmer for three years, and I worked at, and I, then I got in at ThoughtWorks, which is a, a pretty well-known um, software consulting company mm -hmm. uh, with locations all over the world. And um, just within software development, it's, it's a company that um, people respect. And so that was like a big break for me because after I, I left there, I was able to go and do, do lots of interesting things. And then eventually we dug ourselves out, out, self out of debt. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. And my last question for you is, what was a piece of advice someone gave you along the way that really helped? Oh, wow. Um, the first one, there's been a lot. I, I've I sought out a lot of mentors and had, um, gotten a lot of good advice. Um, but one of the f uh, first pieces of advice I got r when I was at my, that first startup, ad it's called Ad Adventions, um, was by the CTO, a guy named Steve Bunis. And I haven't seen him in years and years, but he's probably around Chicago somewhere. But he said, um, it's not, like, you don't need to, to know everything. Like, you don't need to be the guy that everybody thinks knows everything. What you need to do is be the guy who knows how to find the answer. And it's really about, um, and that was eye-opening because it made me realize like, especially as a software developer, you can, um, you don't have to know everything, but thanks to Google, you know, and, ser and like search technology and just all the online resources that we have, um, the answers are always just like a, a few seconds away. Um, and that was really important because at the time it's like, I'm never gonna learn all this stuff. Like I'm, it's never gonna fit all up in my head. I don't have a, like a great memory to begin with, and I'm not very detail-oriented. Um, but he taught me how to search for things and taught me how to like, so, like solve some problems with like debugging like code. Um, and that, so that was huge for me because it just was like, okay, cool. If I just get really good at finding answers, I don't even have to remember them. Hmm. I just have to know how to find them. And that was, that was big for me. Awesome. Well, thank yeah. you so much. No problem. It's been a pleasure. My, my pleasure, too. And um, where can people find you if they're interested in signing up for Dev Bootcamp? Oh, for Dev Bootcamp, uh, devbootcamp.com, D-E-V bootcamp.com. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's the place to go. <laughs> Thank you so much.